Chapter Three. The Law Today. The reader has seen throughout this book that from the very beginning of the Stalin age there have been no politicals in our country. The crowds, the millions driven past while you watched all those millions of fifty-eights, were merely common criminals. Besides, merry, mouthy Nikita Sergeyevich took so many bows from so many platforms. Politicals, not a one. We just don't have them. And as grief grew forgetful, as distance softened craggy contours, as fat formed under the skin, we almost believed it. Even former Zex did. Millions of Zex were released for all to see. So perhaps there really were no politicals left. We had returned. Others joined us. Our friends and families were back. The gaps in our little world of urban intellectuals seemed to be filled. The ring closed. You could sleep undisturbed, and no one would have been taken from the house when you woke. Friends would telephone. No one was missing. Not that we altogether believed it, but for practical purposes we accepted that there were no longer any politicals in jail. Well, yes, even today, 1968, a few hundred bolts are not allowed to go home to their republics. And the curse has not been lifted from the Crimean Tatars, but very soon, no doubt. From outside, as always, as indeed under Stalin, all was clean and tidy; nothing showed. And Nikita was there, glued to his platform. There can be no return to deeds and occurrences such as these, either in the party or in the country generally. May the twenty-second, nineteen fifty-nine. That was before Novocherkask. Now everyone in our country can breathe freely, with no need to worry about the present or the future. March the eighth, nineteen sixty-three, after Novocherkask. Novocherkask, a town of fateful significance in Russia's history, as though the civil war had not left scars enough, it thrust itself beneath the saber yet again. Novocherkask, a whole town rebels, and every trace is licked clean and hidden. Even under Khrushchev, the fog of universal ignorance remained so thick that no one abroad got to know about Novocherkask. There were no Western broadcasts to inform us of it, and even local rumor was stamped out before it could spread, so that the majority of our fellow citizens do not know what event is associated with the name Novocherkask and the date June the second, nineteen sixty-two. Let me then put down here all that I have been able to gather. We can say without exaggeration that this was a turning point in the modern history of Russia. If we leave out the Ivanovo weavers at the beginning of the thirties, theirs was a large-scale strike, but it ended without violence. The flare-up at Novocherkask was the first time the people had spoken out in forty-one years since Konstant and Tambov. Unorganized, leaderless, unpremeditated, it was a cry from the soul of a people who could no longer live as they had lived. On Friday, June the first, one of those carefully considered enactments of which Khrushchev was so fond was published throughout the Union, raising the prices of meat and butter. On that very same day, as demanded by another and quite separate economic plan, piece rates at the huge electric locomotive works in Novocherkask (NEVZ) were lowered, in some cases by thirty percent. That morning, the workers in two shops, the forge and the foundry. Usually obedient creatures of habit, geared to their jobs, could not force themselves to work. So hot had things become for them. Their loud, excited discussions developed into a spontaneous mass meeting, an everyday event in the West, an extraordinary one for us. Neither the engineers nor the chief engineer himself could persuade them. Kurochkin, the works manager, arrived. When the workers asked him, "What are we going to live on now?" this well-fed parasite answered. You're used to guzzling meat pies. Put jam in them instead. He and his retinue barely escaped being torn to pieces. Perhaps if he had answered differently, it would all have blown over. By noon, the strike had spread throughout the enormous locomotive works. Runners were sent to other factories, where the workers wavered but did not come out in support. The Moscow-Rostov railway line runs close to the works, either to make sure that the news would reach Moscow more quickly. Or to prevent troops and tanks from moving in, a large number of women sat down on the tracks to hold up trains. Whereupon the men began pulling up the rails and building barriers. 
strike action of such boldness is unusual in the history of the Russian workers' movement. Slogans appeared on the works building. Down with Khrushchev. Use Khrushchev for sausage meat. While all this was happening, troops and police began converging on the works, which stands, with its settlement, three to four kilometers from Novocherkask across the river Tudzlov. Tanks took up position on the bridge over the Tuzlov. From evening until the following morning, movement inside the city or across the bridge was completely forbidden. Even during the night, the workers' settlement did not quiet down for a moment. Overnight, about 30 workers were arrested as ringleaders and carried off to the city police station. On the morning of June the 2nd, some other enterprises in the town struck, but by no means all of them. Another spontaneous mass meeting at NEVZ decided on a protest march into the town to demand the release of the arrested workers. The procession, only about 300 strong to begin with, you had to be brave, with women and children in its ranks, carrying portraits of Lenin and peaceful slogans, marched over the bridge past the tanks without obstruction, then uphill into the town. Here, their numbers were quickly swelled by curious onlookers, individual workers from other enterprises, and little boys. At several places in the city, people stopped lorries and used them as platforms for speech-making. The whole town was seething. The NEVZ demonstrators marched along the main street, Moskovskaya, and some of them began trying to break down the locked doors of the town police station in the belief that their arrested comrades were inside. They were met with pistol shots. Further on, the street led to the Lenin Monument. It had replaced Klotz's statue of Ataman Platonov, which had been melted down for scrap. And by two narrow paths around a public garden to the headquarters of the town party committee, formerly the Ataman's palace in which General Kaledin had shot himself in 1918. All the streets were choked with people, and here, on the square, the crowd was densest. Many little boys had climbed trees in the garden to get a better view. The party offices were found to be empty. The city authorities had fled to Rostov. The first secretary of the Rostov Oblast Party Committee, Basov, whose name, together with that of Kiev, commander of the North Caucasus Military District, will one day be inscribed over the site of the mass shooting, had arrived in Novocherkask in the meantime, but had rushed back to Rostov in terror. It is even said that he made his escape by jumping from a second-story balcony. Immediately after the Novocherkask events, he went with a delegation to heroic Cuba. Inside the building there was broken glass and the floors were strewn with documents as they must have been after a retreat in the Civil War. A couple of dozen workers walked through the palace, came out on its long balcony and harangued the crowd in halting speeches. It was about 11 a.m. There were no police to be seen in the town, but there were more and more troops, a revealing picture at the first slight shock the civil authorities hid behind the army. Soldiers had occupied the post office the radio station, the bank. By this time, the whole of Novocherkask was beleaguered and every entry and exit barred. For this task, they had brought in, among others, cadets from the officers' training schools in Rostov, leaving some behind to patrol that city. Tanks crawled slowly along Moskovskaya Street, following the route the demonstrators had taken toward party headquarters. Boys started scrambling onto the tanks and obstructing the observation slits. The tanks fired a few blank shells, rattling the windows of shops and houses all along the street. The boys scattered, and the tanks crawled on. And the students? Novocherkask is, of course, a town of students. Where were they all? The students of some institutes, including the Polytechnic and of some technical secondary schools, had been locked in their dormitories or in other school buildings from early morning. Their rectors had thought quickly. But we may as well say it. The students, for their part, show little civic courage. They were presumably glad of this excuse to do nothing. It would take more than the turn of a key to hold back rebel students in the West today, and took more in Russia in days gone by. A scuffle broke out inside the party building, Step by step, the speakers were dragged back inside and soldiers emerged onto the balcony, more and more of them. Remember how the military observed the Kangir mutiny from the balcony of the Steplag head office? A file of riflemen began forcing the crowd back from the small square immediately before the palace toward the railings of the garden. 
Several witnesses say unanimously that these soldiers were all non-Russians, Caucasians brought in from the other end of the oblast to replace the cordon from the local garrison previously posted there. But not all witnesses agree that the previous cordon had been ordered to open fire and that the order was not carried out because the captain who received it killed himself in front of his men rather than pass it on. According to this version, the soldiers who refused to fire into the crowd were exiled to Yakutia. That an officer committed suicide is beyond doubt, but accounts of the circumstances are vague, and no one knows the name of this hero of conscience. The crowd backed away, but no one expected the worst. It is not known who gave the order, but these soldiers raised their rifles and fired a first volley over the heads of the crowd. Those who stood near enough know, but they were either killed or taken out of circulation. Perhaps General Plief had no immediate intention of firing on the crowd. Perhaps the situation got out of hand. The burst fired over the heads of the crowd found the trees in the little garden and the boys who had climbed into them, some of whom fell to the ground. The crowd, it seems, gave a roar, whereupon the soldiers, whether at a command or because they saw red or in panic, started firing freely into the crowd, and yes, with dum-dum bullets. There is reliable evidence that 47 were killed by dum-dum bullets alone. Remember Kangir, the 16 at the guardhouse? The crowd fled in panic, jamming the narrow paths around the garden, but the troops went on firing at their backs as they retreated. They continued firing until the large square beyond the garden and the Lenin statue was completely empty all along the former Platovsky Prospect and as far as Moskovskaya Street. An eyewitness says that the area looked like one great mound of corpses, but many of those lying there were, of course, only wounded. Information from a variety of sources is more or less unanimous that some 70 or 80 people were killed, rather fewer than before the Winter Palace, yet all Russia was outraged by January the 9th and observed its anniversary yearly. When shall we begin commemorating June the 2nd? The soldiers looked around for lorries and buses, commandeered them, loaded them with the dead and the wounded, and dispatched them to the high-walled military hospital. For a day or two afterward, these buses went around with blood-stained seats. That day, just as in Kangir, movie cameras took pictures of the rebels on the streets. The firing ceased, the terror passed, the crowd poured back onto the square and was fired upon again. All this happened between noon and 1 p.m. This is what an observant witness saw at 2 p.m. There are about eight tanks of different types standing on the square in front of party headquarters. A cordon of soldiers stands before them. The square is almost deserted. There are only small groups of people, mostly youngsters, standing about and shouting at the soldiers. On the square, puddles of blood have formed in the depressions in the pavement, I am not exaggerating. I never suspected till now that there could be so much blood. The benches in the public garden are splattered with blood. There are blood stains on its sanded paths and on the whitewashed tree trunks in the public garden. The whole square is scored with tank tracks. A red flag, which the demonstrators had been carrying, is propped against the wall of party headquarters, and a grey cap splashed with red-brown blood has been slung over the top of its pole. Across the facade of the party building hangs a red banner, there for some time past. The people and the party are one. People go up to the soldiers to curse them or to appeal to their conscience. How could you do it? Who did you think you were shooting at? Your own people you were shooting at. They make excuses. It wasn't us. We've only just been brought in and posted here. We had nothing to do with it. That's how efficient our murderers are. And yet people talk about bureaucratic sluggishness. Those soldiers have already been taken away and perplexed Russians put in their place. He knows his business, that General P.F. Toward five or six o'clock, the square gradually filled with people again. They were brave, the people of Novocherkask. The town radio kept appealing to them. Citizens, do not fall for provocation. Go home quietly. The riflemen still stood there. The blood had not been mopped up and again they pressed forward. Shouts from the crowd, more and more people, and another impromptu meeting. They knew by now that six senior members of the Central Committee had flown in, 
probably arriving before the first shootings. Among them, needless to say, Mikoyan, the expert on Budapest-type situations, and Frol Kodzlov. The names of the other four are not known for certain. They stayed in the Cook's building, formerly the headquarters of the Cadet Corps, as though it were a fortress. And a delegation of younger workers from NEVZ was sent to tell them what had happened. A buzz went through the crowd. Let Mikoyan come down here. Let him see all this blood for himself. Mikoyan wouldn't come down, thank you. But a reconnaissance helicopter flew low over the square around six o'clock, inspected it, flew off again. Shortly afterward, the workers' delegation came back from Cook's. As agreed, the military cordon let the delegates through and officers escorted them to the balcony of the party building. Silence. The delegates reported to the crowd that they had seen the Central Committee members and told them about this bloody Saturday and that Kozlov had wept when he heard about the children falling from the trees at the first volley. You know, Frol Kozlov, the Leningrad party gang boss, the cruelest of Stalinists, he wept. The Central Committee members had promised to investigate these events and severely punish those responsible. The very promises made to us in Osoblag. But for the present, everyone must go home to prevent the outbreak of fresh disorders in the town. The meeting, however, did not disperse. The crowd grew ever denser toward the evening. The desperate courage of Novocherkask. There is a story that the Politburo team made the decision that evening to deport the whole population of the town, every last one of them. I can believe this. It would have been nothing extraordinary after the deportation of nations. Wasn't the same Mikoyan close to Stalin when that happened? Around nine in the evening, they tried to drive the people away from the palace with tanks. But as soon as the drivers switched on their engines, people clustered around the tanks, blocking the hatches and the observation slits. The tanks stalled. The riflemen stood by and made no effort to help the tank crews. An hour later, tanks and armoured personnel carriers appeared from the opposite side of the square with an escort of Tommy gunners perched on top of them. Our battle experience counts for something. We are the ones who defeated the fascists. Advancing at high speed, to the jeers of young people on the footpaths, the students had been released toward evening. They cleared the roadways of Moskovskaya Street and the former Platovsky Prospect. At last, toward midnight, the riflemen began firing tracer bullets into the air, and the crowd slowly dispersed. What power there is in a popular disturbance, how quickly it changes the whole political situation. The night before, there had been a curfew, and people had been frightened anyway, but now the whole town was strolling about and hooting at the soldiers. A people transformed. Can it be so near to breaking through the crust of this half-century into a completely different atmosphere? On June the 3rd, the town radio broadcast speeches by Mikoyan and Kozlov. Kozlov did not weep, nor did they any longer promise to find the culprits, those in higher places. What they now said was that these events were the result of enemy provocation, and that these enemies would be severely punished. The people had, of course, gone from the square by now. Mikoyan said further that dum-dum bullets had never been adopted as part of the equipment of Soviet troops and that they must therefore have been used by enemies of the state. But who were these enemies? How had they parachuted into the country? Where were they hiding? Show us just one. We are so used to being treated like fools. Enemies, they say, and all is explained. In the Middle Ages, it was devils. This is a woman schoolteacher from Novocherkask holding forth in a train in 1968. The military did not shoot anyone. They fired only one warning burst into the air. The shooting was done by saboteurs with dumb, dumb bullets. Where did they get them? Saboteurs can get absolutely anything. They shot at soldiers and workers alike. The workers seemed to go mad, attack the soldiers and beat them. But how were the soldiers to blame? Afterward, Mikoyan walked around the streets and went into people's houses to see how they lived. The women offered him strawberries. This is all that history has preserved to date. The shops were immediately the richer for butter, sausage, and many other things not seen in those parts for a long time, or anywhere outside the capitals. The wounded all vanished without trace. Not one of them went home. 
Instead, the families of the wounded and the killed, who of course wanted to know what had become of their kin, were deported to Siberia. So were many of those involved in the demonstration who had been noticed or photographed. Some participants were dealt with in a series of trials in camera. There were also two public trials, with entry by ticket for factory party officials and for the town apparatchiki. At one of these, nine men were sentenced to be shot and two women to fifteen years' imprisonment. The membership of the town party committee remained as before. On the Saturday following Bloody Saturday, the town radio announced that the workers of the electric locomotive works have solemnly undertaken to fulfil their seven-year plan ahead of time. If the Tsar had not been such a ninny, he would have realised that all he needed to do on January the 9th in Petersburg was hunt down the workers carrying banners and pin charges of banditry on them. After that, there would have been no revolutionary movement worth mentioning. At Alexandrovo, in 1961, a year before Novocherkask, the police beat a man to death while he was under arrest and then would not allow his body to be carried past their precinct to the cemetery. The crowd was furious and burned down the police station. Arrests followed immediately. There was a similar incident about the same time in Murom. What would the appropriate charge now be? Under Stalin, even a tailor who stuck a needle in a newspaper could get Article 58. Now a more sensible view was taken. Wrecking a police station should not be regarded as a political act. It was ordinary banditry. Instructions were handed down to this effect. Mass disorders should not be treated as political offences. If they're not political, what is? So all at once there were no more politicals. But one stream has never dried up in the USSR and still flows, a stream of criminals untouched by the beneficent wave summoned to life, etc. A stream which flowed uninterruptedly through all those decades, whether Leninist norms were infringed or strictly observed, and flowed in Khrushchev's day more furiously than ever. I mean the believers, those who resisted the new wave of cruel persecution, the wholesale closing of churches. Monks who were slung out of their monasteries. Krasnov Levitin has given us a great deal of information about this. Stubborn sectarians, especially those who refuse to perform military service. There's nothing we can do about it. We're really very sorry, but you're directly aiding imperialism. We let you off lightly nowadays. It's five years, first time around. These are in no sense politicals. They are religionists, but still they have to be re-educated. Believers must be dismissed from their jobs merely for their faith. Komsomols must be sent along to break the windows of believers. Believers must be officially compelled to attend anti-religious lectures. Church doors must be cut down with blow torches. Domes pulled down with horses attached to tractors. Gatherings of old women broken up with fire hoses. Is this what you meant by dialogue, French comrades? As the monks of the Pochayev Monastery were told and the Soviet of Workers' Deputies, if we always observe Soviet laws, we shall have to wait a long time for communism. Only in extreme cases, when educational methods do not help, is recourse to the law necessary. Here we can dazzle the world with the diamond pure nobility of our laws today. We no longer try people in closed courts, as under Stalin. We no longer try them in absentia. We try them semi-publicly, that is to say, in the presence of a semi-public. I hold in my hand a record of the trial of some Baptists at Nikitovka in the Donbass in January 1964. This is how it's done. On the pretense that their identity must be checked, the Baptists who arrived to attend the trial were held in jail for three days until the trial was over and to give them a fright. Someone, a free citizen, who threw flowers to the defendants, got ten days. So did a Baptist who kept a record of the trial, and his notes were taken away. But another record survived. A bunch of hand-picked Komsomols were let in before the general public by a side door, so that they could occupy the front rows. While the trial was in progress, there were shouts from the spectators. Pour kerosene over the lot and set fire to them. The court did nothing to curb this righteous indignation. Typical of its procedures, 
It admitted the evidence of hostile neighbours and also that of terrorised miners. Little girls of nine and eleven were brought before the court. Who the hell cares what effect it has on them as long as we get our verdict? Their exercise books with texts from the scriptures were introduced as exhibits. One of the defendants, Baz Bey, father of nine children, was a miner who had never received any support from the union committee at his pit because he was a Baptist. But they managed to confuse his daughter Nina, a schoolgirl in the eighth grade, and to suborn her with fifty rubles from the union committee, and a promise to place her in an institute later on, so that during the investigation she made fantastic statements against her father. He had tried to poison her with a sour fruit drink. When the believers were hiding in the woods for their prayer meeting, because they were persecuted in the settlement, they had had a radio transmitter. A tall tree with wire wound all around it. Afterward, these lying statements began to prey on Nina's mind. She became mentally ill and was put in the violent ward of an asylum. Nonetheless, she was produced in court in the expectation that she would stick to her evidence, but she repudiated every word of it. The interrogator dictated what I had to say himself. It made no difference. The shameless judge ignored her latest statements. And regarded only her earlier evidence as valid. Whenever depositions favourable to the prosecution came unstuck, this is the typical and regular dodge used by the courts. They ignore what is brought out in court and base themselves on faked evidence obtained in the preliminary investigation. Now, what do you mean by that? It says here in your deposition, you testified during the investigation. What right have you to retract now? That's an offence too, you know. The judge is not at all interested in the substance of the case. In the truth, the Baptists are persecuted because they do not accept preachers sent by an atheist plenipotentiary of the state, but prefer their own. Under Baptist rules, any brother can preach the gospel. There is a directive from the Oblast Party Committee: put them on trial and forcibly take their children from them. And this will be carried out, although with its left hand, the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet has just. July the second, nineteen sixty-two, signed the World Convention on the Fight Against Discrimination in the Sphere of Education. But of course, we signed it for the sake of the American Negroes. How else could it concern us? One of its points is that parents must be allowed to provide for the religious and moral education of their children in accordance with their own convictions. But that is precisely what we cannot allow. Anyone who speaks in court on the substance of the case. Anyone who tries to clarify the issue is invariably interrupted, diverted from his train of thought, deliberately confused by the judge, who conducts the debate on this level. How can you talk about the end of the world when we are committed to the building of communism? This is from the closing statement made by one young girl, Genia Kloponina. Instead of going to the cinema or to dances, I used to read the Bible and say my prayers. And just for that, you are taking my freedom from me. Yes, to be free is a great happiness, but to be free from sin is a greater still. Lenin said that only in Turkey and Russia did such shameful phenomena as religious persecution still exist. I've never been in Turkey and know nothing about it, but how things are in Russia, you can see for yourselves. She was cut short. The sentences: two of them got five years in the camps. Two of them, four years, and Baz Bey, father of all those children, got three. The defendants accepted their sentences joyfully and said a prayer. The representatives from enterprises shouted, "Not long enough! Make it more! Throw kerosene over them and put a match to it." The long-suffering Baptists took note and kept count and set up a council of prisoners' relatives, which began issuing manuscript bulletins about all the persecutions. From these bulletins, we learn that from 1961 to June 1964, 197 Baptists were condemned, 15 of them women. One of the trials of populists a hundred years ago was called the Trial of the 193. Lord, what a fuss there was! What emotions were stirred! It even found its way into the textbooks. They are all listed by name. Prisoners, dependents, now left without means of support, have also been counted. Four hundred and forty-two, of whom three hundred and forty-one are under school age. 
The majority get five years of exile, but some get five years in a strict regime camp, narrowly escaping the hardened criminals' motley, with three to five years of exile in addition. B. M. Zdorovets from Orshany in Kharkov Oblast got seven years of strict regime for his faith. A 76-year-old Y. V. Arend was put inside, as were the whole Lodzovoy family, father, mother, and son. Yevgeny M. Sirokin, a Group 1 disabled veteran of the Fatherland War, blind in both eyes, was condemned in the village of Sokolovo, Zmievsky district, Kharkov Oblast, to three years in a camp for bringing up his children Lyuba, Nadia, and Raya as Christians, and they were taken away from him by order of the court. The court trying the Baptist M. I. Brodovsky at Nikolaev, October the 6th, 1966, was not too squeamish to use crudely faked documents. When the defendant protested, This is dishonest of you, they barked back at him, The law will crush you, smash you, destroy you. The law, my friend. Not one of your acts of extrajudicial vengeance, as practiced in the years when norms were still observed. We recently got to know S. Karavansky's soul-chilling petition, which was transmitted from a camp to the outside world. The author had been sentenced to 25 years, had served 16 of them, 1944 to 1960, had been released, evidently under the two-thirds rule, had married, had begun a university course, but no, in 1965 they came for him again. Get yourself ready, you still have nine years to go. Where else is this possible? Under what other code of law on earth except ours? They had hung quarters around people's necks like iron collars, sentences which would end sometime in the 70s. Suddenly a new code is promulgated, 1961, with no sentence higher than 15 years. Even a first-year law student can see that those 25-year sentences are thereby rescinded. Only we do not agree that they are. Yell yourself hoarse, beat your head on the wall if you like. They are not rescinded. We feel rather that you should step back inside and finish your time. There are quite a few people like this, people who are not affected by the epidemic of releases under Khrushchev, the teammates, cellmates, transit prison acquaintances whom we left behind. We have long ago forgotten them in our new lives, but they still shuffle hopelessly, drearily, numbly about the same little patches of trampled earth with the same watchtowers and barbed wire fences all around them. The faces in the papers change, the speeches from platforms change. People fight against the cult and then stop fighting. But the 25-year prisoners, Stalin's godchildren, are still inside. Karavansky cites the blood-freezing prison careers of several such people. All you freedom-loving left-wing thinkers in the West, you left laborites, you progressive American, German, and French students, as far as you are concerned, none of this amounts to much. As far as you are concerned, this whole book of mine is a waste of effort. You may suddenly understand it all some day, but only when you yourselves hear, hands behind your backs there, and step ashore on our archipelago. Still, there really is no comparison between the numbers of political prisoners now and in Stalin's time. They are no longer counted in millions or in hundreds of thousands. Is this because the law has been reformed? No, it is just that the ship has changed course for a time. Courtroom epidemics flare up just as they used to, lightening the labors of the legal brain. Even the newspapers will keep you abreast if you know how to read them. When they start writing about hooligans, you know that the courts are jailing people wholesale on charges of hooliganism. If they write about theft from the state, you know that the fashionable charge is embezzlement. Zex, writing from today's colonies, tell us despondently that it is useless trying to find justice. What you read in the press is one thing. Real life is another. V.I.D. I'm sick of being an outcast from my society and my people, but where can I get justice? The interrogator's word carries more weight than mine. Yet what knowledge or insight can she, a young girl of twenty-three, have? How can she possibly imagine the fate they can send a man to?
VK. The reason they never reopen cases is that if they did, some of them might become redundant. L blank N. Stalinist methods of investigation and trial have simply migrated from the political to the criminal sphere, and that's all there is to it. G S. Let us note carefully what these suffering people have told us. One, retrial is impossible because the judicial caste might collapse. Two, nowadays they use the criminal clauses to make mincemeat of people, just as they once used Article 58. If they did not, what would they feed on, and what would become of the archipelago? Briefly, suppose one citizen wishes to rid the world of another whom he dislikes. Not, of course, straightforwardly with a knife between the ribs, but legally. What is the surest way of doing it? Formerly, he would have had to write a denunciation under Article Fifty Eight Ten, but now he should begin by consulting the professionals, investigating officers, policemen, court officials. That sort of citizen always has friends of this sort. To find what is in fashion this year, for what type of offender are the nets being laid? In which category are the courts required to increase their yield? Find the appropriate clause and stick that in him. It's as good as any knife. Thus, a storm of accusations under the rape clause raged for a long time after Nikita, in a heated moment, ordered minimum sentences of twelve years. Thousands of hammers in every locality began busily riveting on twelve-year fetters, for the smiths must never stand idle. Now. This clause deals with delicate and very private matters. Weigh it carefully, and you will see that in some ways it resembles Article Fifty Eight Ten. The offences covered by each are committed tete a tete. They are difficult to verify. They are shy of witnesses, and that is just what the courts require. Take the S blank V case. Two Leningrad women were summoned to the police station. Had they been at a party with some men? Yes. Had sexual intercourse taken place? This had already been established with the aid of a reliable informer. Um, yes. Right then. Which is it? Did you take part in the sexual act voluntarily or against your will? If voluntary, we shall have to regard you as prostitutes. You will hand over your passports and get out of Leningrad in forty-eight hours. If it was against your will, you must bring a charge of rape. The women were not a bit anxious to leave Leningrad, so the men got twelve years each. Our obtuse, our blinkered, our hulking brute of a judicial system can live only if it is infallible. The brute is so strong and so sure of itself only because it never reconsiders its decisions, because every officer of the court can lay about him as he pleases in the certainty that no one will ever correct him. To this end, there exists the tacit understanding that every complaint, whatever summit of summits you send it to. Will be referred back to the very authority of which you are complaining. Let no officer of the court, prosecutor, or investigator be censured for abusing his office, for giving free rein to bad temper or a desire for personal vengeance, for making a mistake or for misconducting a case. We will cover up for him, protect him, form a wall around him. We are the law, and that is what law is for. What is the good of beginning an investigation and then not bringing charges? Does this not mean that the interrogator's work is wasted? What is the good of a hearing without a conviction? Wouldn't the people's court be letting the investigating officer down and wasting his time? What does it mean when an oblast court overturns the decision of a people's court? It means that the higher court has added another botched job to the oblast's record. Think of the discomfort you would be causing your comrades in the profession. What's the point of it? Once begun, as the result of a denunciation, let's say, an investigation must end without fail in a conviction which cannot possibly be quashed. Above all, don't let one another down, and don't let the RICOM down. Do what they tell you. In return, they will see that you come to no harm. Another very important thing about the courts today. There is no tape recorder, no stenographer, just a thick-fingered secretary with the leisurely penmanship of an eighteenth-century schoolgirl, laboriously recording some part of the proceedings in the transcript. This record is not read out during the session, and no one is allowed to see it until the judge has looked it over and approved it. Only what the judge confirms will remain on record will have happened in court, while things that we have heard with our own ears vanish like smoke. They never happened at all. 
In his mind's eye, the judge can always see the shiny black visage of truth, the telephone in his chambers. This oracle will never fail you as long as you do what it says. Endure and flourish, O noble company of judges. We exist for you, not you for us. May justice be a thick piled carpet beneath your feet. If it goes well with you, then all is well. The proven reliability of the judicial system makes the lives of the police much easier. It enables them to apply without misgiving the method known as the trailer or the crime sack. Because of the slackness, the inefficiency, the boneheadedness of the local police, crime after crime after crime remains unsolved. But to keep the books straight, criminals must be exposed and cases closed. So they wait for a suitable opportunity. A man lands in the police station. Somebody pliant, easily bullied, not too bright, and they saddle him with all these unsolved crimes. He's the one, all this year, the elusive master criminal, pummel and starve him till he confesses everything, puts his name to it all, earns himself a sentence commensurate with the grand total of his crimes, and so wipe a blot from the district. The health of society is much improved since no sin goes unpunished. And the police in charge of criminal investigations are given prizes. The health of society has improved still further, and justice has been further reinforced in recent years since the cry went up that parasites should be seized, tried, and deported. This decree was also a partial replacement for the elastic 5810, now only a memory. Accusations made under it proved just as insidious, just as flimsy, and just as irrefutable. They managed to use it against I. Brodsky, the poet. The meaning of the word was skillfully distorted from the start. Real parasites, highly paid drones, sat on the bench or at their bureaucratic desks while sentences rained down on paupers with skills and an appetite for work, who knocked themselves out trying to earn a bit extra when the working day was over. How viciously! With the undying hatred of the overfed for the hungry, they fell upon these idlers. Two of Ajubey's unscrupulous journalists had the effrontery to declare that parasites were not being banished far enough from Moscow. They were allowed to receive parcels and money orders from relatives. Discipline was not strict enough. They are not made to work from dawn to dusk. These are their very words: from dawn to dusk. What communist dawn? What constitutional order? We may wonder can call for such drudgery. We have listed several important streams, which, together with the endless spate of embezzlers, ensure that the archipelago is continually replenished. Nor is it altogether wasted effort for the people's brigades, druzhniki, those freebooters or storm troopers commissioned by the militia, unmentioned in the constitution, and free from responsibility before the law, to walk the streets or stay comfortably in their command posts, knocking out the teeth of prisoners. Reinforcements flow in to the archipelago, and although we have had a classless society for so long, although the glow of the communist conflagration half fills the sky, we are used to the idea that crime never ceases, never decreases, and indeed that no one now seems to promise any such thing. In the 1930s, they assured us we're almost there, just a few more years. They don't even make such statements any more. The law in our country, in its might and its flexibility, is unlike anything called law elsewhere on earth. The stupid Romans had a formula: the law has no retroactive force. With us, it has. An old reactionary proverb may mutter: "Laws aren't written for what's gone and done." In our country, they are. If a modish new decree comes out and the law itches to apply it to persons already in custody, Why not let it do so? This is what happened to the currency speculators and bribe takers. Lists were sent from, say, Kiev to Moscow, where the names of those to whom the law could be retrospectively applied were ticked off, and they were given a longer stretch or promoted to nine grams of lead accordingly. Then again, in our country, the law is clairvoyant. You might suppose that before a trial takes place, the course of the hearing and the verdict would be unknown. But you may find socialist legality publishing all this before the trial takes place. How can it know? Just ask yourself. 
C. The organ of the Public Prosecutor's Office of the USSR, number 1, January 1962. Signed for the press on December the 27th, 1961. On pages 73 to 74, there is an article by Grigoriev Gruzda called Fascist Hangmen. It contains a report on the trial of some Estonian war criminals at Tartu. The writer describes the questioning of witnesses, the exhibits before the court, the cross-examination of one defendant. The murderer cynically answered. The reactions of the public, the prosecutor's speech. It further reports that sentence of death was passed. All these things indeed occurred exactly as described, but not till January the 16th, 1962. See Pravda for January the 17th, by which time the journal was already in print and on sale. The trial had been postponed and the journal had not been warned. The journalist concerned got one year's forced labor. Then again, Soviet law has forgotten all about the sin of bearing false witness and simply does not regard it as a crime. A legion of false witnesses thrives in our midst. They go sedately on their way to an honorable old age, bask in a golden sunset at the end of their days. Ours is the only country in the world and in history to pamper perjurers. Then again, Soviet law does not punish murdering judges and murdering prosecutors. They all enjoy long and honorable careers and live to be noble elders. Then again, no one can deny that Soviet law is capable of those abrupt changes of course, those sudden swerves characteristic of all anxious creative thought. At times, the law veers toward sharp reduction of crime in a single year, arrest fewer, try fewer, release convicted offenders on probation. At other times, it veers in the opposite direction. Evildoers endlessly multiply. No more probation. Send more to hard labor and special regime camps. Stiffer sentences. Execute the villains. Whatever storms may buffet it, the vessel of the law sails smoothly and majestically on. Our supreme courts, our supreme prosecutors, our old hands, and no gust will take them by surprise. They will conduct their plenary sessions. They will issue their instructions. And every insane change, of course, will be shown to be a long-felt need, a logical result of our whole historic development, prophetically envisaged in the one true doctrine. The vessel of Soviet law is ready for the sharpest turn. If orders come tomorrow to put millions inside again for their way of thinking, or to deport whole peoples, the same peoples as before, or others, or rebellious towns, or to pin four numbers on prisoners again. Its mighty hull will scarcely tremble, its stem will not buckle. There remains what Dershavin tells us, what only those who have experienced it for themselves can feel in their hearts. An unjust court is worse than brigandage. Yes, that remains true as true as it was under Stalin, as it was all through the years described in this book. Many fundamental principles, decrees and laws, contradictory or complementary, have been promulgated and printed. But it is not in accordance with them that our country lives and that arrests are made, trials held, expert evidence given. Only in those few cases, 15% perhaps, in which the subject of investigation and judicial proceedings affects neither the interests of the state, nor the reigning ideology, nor the personal interests or comfort of some office holder. Only very rarely can the officers of the court enjoy the privilege of trying a case without telephoning somebody to seek instructions, of trying it on its merits and as conscience dictates. All other cases, the overwhelming majority... Criminal or civil, it makes no difference. Inevitably affect in some important way the interests of the chairman of a Kolkots or a village Soviet, a shop foreman, a factory manager, the head of a housing bureau, a block sergeant, the investigating officer or commander of a police district, the medical superintendent of a hospital, a chief planning officer, the heads of administrations or ministries, special sections or personnel sections, the secretaries of district or oblast party committees, and upward, ever upward. 
In all such cases, calls are made from one discreet inner office to another. Leisurely, lowered voices give friendly advice. Steady and steer the decision to be reached in the trial of a wretched little man caught in the tangled schemes, which he would not understand even if he knew them, of those set in authority over him. The naively trusting little newspaper reader goes into the courtroom conscious that he is in the right. His reasonable arguments are carefully rehearsed, and he lays them before the somnolent, mask-like faces on the bench, never suspecting that sentence has been passed on him already, that there are no courts of appeal, no proper channels and due procedures through which a malignant, a corrupt, a soul-searingly unjust verdict can be undone. There is only a war, and its bricks are laid in a mortar of lies. We call this chapter the law today. It should rightly be called there is no law. The same treacherous secrecy, the same fog of injustice, still hangs in our air, worse than the smoke of city chimneys. For half a century and more, the enormous state has towered over us, girded with hoops of steel. The hoops are still there. There is no law.